Chase at the information desk. We'd like to welcome you all to the first edition Brings Healing for a World in Pain, Somnath Hore Wounds. In the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times, said Berthold Brecht. Somnath Hore's artistic horizon is an echo of his thought. A pioneering artist and empathetic thinker, Somnath's practice reflected on human suffering with a deep sense of compassion. Please join author Likla and illustrator Kripa in conversation with Rubina Karode, director and chief curator, Kiran Nader Museum of Art, and Rina Lott, director, Akar Prakar, to deconstruct how books like Somnath Hore wounds exemplify the healing power of art and enable conversations around emotional well-being and our ability to cope with pain and grief in today's world. I'm very happy to have the entire panel with me on stage. Can we please have the AV played? On that note, over to each one of you. Thank you. It's a children's book. So we'd like a little excitement. Would you be willing to do a small exercise with me? Those who are willing, please raise your hand. Fantastic. Those who are not, please raise your hands too. Those who may be willing, please raise your hands. That's good. Now the exercise is very, very simple. Just move to the edge of your chair with your feet planted very strongly on the ground. I want your hands free. Now put your left hand on your thigh and your right hand over your palm. Now close your eyes and move your hand from your wrist to your fingers gently five times, keeping your eyes closed. Yes, Sunena, you can do it. Now, take your right palm, right hand, and put it on your forehead. Keep your eyes closed while you do this. Now, from the forehead to the top of the head, move your hand gently back, forward to the back. Now, as you do this, think of your mother or think of a loving figure in your life. You can release your hands. Sit for a moment and assess what is the feeling that went through your body, mind, and heart. So, Rubina, what did you feel? I think uh, touch, whether someone else's or your own, makes you feel as if you're healing. Uh, could you? Yeah. Kripa? My uh, grandmother's uh, touch loving arms on my head. Okay. And for you, Litla? I felt reassured. Yeah. Super. So I'm sure a lot of you had many different emotions similar to this. So to my mind, these are emotions that point towards something we call healing. Now, Sobhna Thor was a very serious artist. And he said that every interaction in life, every relationship leads to a wound. 
now that you know what healing feels like. Am I right? Do you know what healing feels like for one moment? Yes? I think you're ready for the wounds. So, Kripa, you've done this wonderful book for children. Uh, sorry, Likla, you've done this wonderful book for children and you've called it Wounds. Would you like to talk about why did you call it Wounds? And uh, what was it about Shomnathor's story that inspired you? And uh, maybe I'd like to also know the audience would like to know your personal responses to his work and to the book. Right. Thank you, Rina. Uh, it's actually a question we've heard before. You know, why, why are you calling a kid's book wounds? Isn't the concept of wounds very adult, uh, very dark, too dark for children? Um, and when I first heard the question, I was a bit surprised by that because I hadn't been thinking about it um, from that perspective. And in fact, my book starts uh, with these words. Have you ever had a wound, a little bruise, a cut, a scab that you simply cannot look away from? And I think the way it changes colors, purples, reds, and greens, oh, and how it itches on your skin and in your mind. I don't think there's any one of us here as children who hasn't fallen and scraped our knees and had those delicious purple scabs that just itched and itched. And so it was such a normal part of our, you know, of our everyday of our growing up, right? Pain, it's, it's just a normal human condition. And uh, just like love or friendship or, you know, imagination, it's as much a theme that's relevant to children. And that that's where um, the idea came from, I guess. Uh, to talk about the the actual title of the book, I think I would have to talk about the artist first. Um, you know, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be here at this intersection of art and culture. We've, we've had so many wonderful talks from, um, you know, the miniatures and um, portraits and Bundelkan painting. So we bring an artist from another part of India, from another time. And uh, 2021 was, in fact, his birth centenary year. And so it was an opportunity for us to look back 100 years and see what was happening at that point in India that period, uh, the tumultuous period leading up to the Indian independence when he was, you know, a young man. Um, I remember, uh, so I had access to his journals that Siegel has published from various stages of his life. And I was just marveling at this illustration he'd done of one of the leaders of the farmers movement at that time thinking, oh my gosh, this is someone from 100 years ago. And I wanted to bring that feeling of awe to children as well, right? History is not something distant, but something that's in integral to us. And so that's kind of the point of it, to, to bring art um, to children, just as it is as much a part of our lives. Um, so as I read about him, I think what stayed with me and what inspired me was his obsession to understand this human condition that is pain. Um, and it stayed with him from, you know, from those early years to his later explorations of sculpture, um, of printmaking. Um, there was so much, you know, violence and mark making and exploration of the concept of wounds. I couldn't stay away from it. And it, he, in fact, has multiple series entitled Wounds, even though they're fairly different. So that just had to kind of be the, the name of the book uh, to me. This is what it looks like in case you <laughs> missed it. But I think, you know, from a personal connection to it, when I was researching and writing the book, I was very much in his life, in his paintings. I wasn't really thinking of myself. Mm -hmm. And it's only a few months later when, you know, Kripa came on board as the illustrator and other people were looking at the book that I had a chance to think about my own, um, my own pain and my own grief. And uh, I wrote this in 2020 as well. So uh, Time and again, as I see people interact with the book, including myself, there's such a deep connection to our pain that when you're confronted with art about it, it's, it's such a natural and personal and individual connection that comes through whether you're a child or an adult. So, yeah. Okay, thank you so much uh, for letting us know how you were influenced and affected by the Wounds book. The Wounds is a difficult word and uh, Kripa, uh, I can say that Somnath Hor is a difficult artist yeah. and uh, his art was also very serious. 
and you've been able to translate his art into a book for children in fact both of you of course she wrote it and she wrote the storyline and you executed it with your illustrations so i just want to know that how did you manage to do that and uh, mm, how did the children receive it you know that's really important i know you've done some workshops with children in kolkata and uh, i'd like to know what you have to say uh reena you're right shomna thor is a serious senior artist um but our idea of children's books uh you know over simplifying children's books to uh, uh to you know to make it simple enough uh to fit uh children's literature um is completely contradictory um i believe that children even very young children have this innate ability to decipher complex emotions abstract emotions as complex as uh, say death pain loss of a loved one love and they can do it um recently i was uh, reading an interview of a school teacher mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the teacher articulated a beautiful uh, a very interesting uh, anecdote that happened in her class uh, where two little girls were talking to each other and about about philosophy so uh, girl number 1 uh, asks girl number 2 what is philosophy girl number 2 non challengingly says oh philosophy i know philosophy <laughs> i know philosophy you know sometimes when you're alone when you're in a room and you have nothing to do you're bored you're staring at the wall that is philosophy <laughs> yes and <laughs> as i read that it just struck me that even the most acclaimed philosophers would not be you know would not could not have put it so beautifully <laughs> you know coming back to children's literature i do not think that i would have illustrated this book any differently if it was for an adult uh, uh, reader mm -hmm. uh you know because children have this innate ability and we need not over simplify it for them reena i want to talk a little about our workshop in kolkata you were there yes. and it was i think one of the most intense time intense workshops we had um these were a bunch of uh, ninth graders yes. who had come uh, uh, to akar prakar uh, museum uh, i mean akar yes. prakar gallery and reena took them around uh, the gallery showing them introducing them to yes. shomnath's artworks and post that they came out in the lawn area they were sitting um and this was their first outing uh, post the lockdown school outing post the lockdown so they were all very enthusiastic about it uh so they came and they sat down and we were a little apprehensive because they were so energetic and enthusiastic we are going to talk about something as deep as wounds so we allowed them some time to settle in and uh, then i started reading i started the discussion by uh, reading a few pages of the book and then i threw open this question to them what are the wounds you carry within you and i allowed some time for this cathartic question to sink in because it's a very deep question they needed that time to reflect on it and one by one to my surprise like a gentle blossoming flower they allowed us a visit into their tender aching hearts mm. i can never forget reena if you remember siddarth i can yes. never forget this child he when he entered the gallery he came in with such a happy cheerful disposition and and then he uh, he was the first one to speak about the question uh, that was put out to them 
and uh, he shared with us with this unwavering courage that his mother had passed away uh, due to covid just 7 months ago and uh, we had no words yes and one after the other another child came up she broke down she said uh, my grandmother passed away yeah. and then another child who was uh, who was carrying the burden and the pain of eve teasing uh, body shaming to so many wounds that these children held within them almost like a pandora's box sort of started yeah. coming out and yet others who could not express them verbally um, you know verbally were just silently sitting there and and crying and sobbing mm. and sobbing and i was a little worried should i have asked them such a question and so soon after uh, what uh, you know globally we've been through uh, but later on i think when i went back uh, to my peaceful uh, state of mind i reflected over this and i'm so happy we did that reena because what it essentially did was it sort of brought out rather melted and liquefied all those fossilized those held up solidified emotions within them absolutely i think kripa that moment was quite a moment for all of us uh rubina we had shared the videos with you and uh, the way the children responded was really something i had never seen before uh so i think it's somnath's magic as you kept saying as kripa kept saying it's somnath who has blessed this book and that's why people are able to respond to it so rubina i have been following your work you as the director and chief curator of the kiranagar museum of art you have been doing exhibitions curatorial notes you've done talks and i've been following these and i find that there is a preoccupation if i may say that with pain and healing in what you express through your exhibitions or through your writing i particularly found that with uh, two artists that i'd like to name uh, one is nasreen mohammadi and the other is jay shri chakravarti and i find that this preoccupation is so predominantly there maybe it's an underground thing i don't know so i want you to elaborate how this also kind of translates of this point can be discussed with regard to shomnathor's work thank you rina can you hear me hello um i just want to start by saying that um, heading a museum of art and being a curator who whose job is to make exhibitions on art whose job is to do writing on art whose job is to make art accessible to the people it's a very 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 profound and very very exciting field to work with because you go through journeys of life journeys of artists and i have been through many of these artists as reena has just mentioned because i've spent more than 30 years doing this but what i realize the most is that we do exhibitions on artists to show to chronicle their life to show what they did in the first phase the second phase later on and so on or we write books there are a lot of book on artists life which caters to a formal analysis of the language that they evolved what is their visual language what do they do with sculpture making what do they do with print making what do they do with drawing or painting but i think why this book and this kind of collaboration appeals to me is because i believe that an artist spends an entire lifetime not just sharpening his skills to draw and paint that is important of course for expression okay but what is most important is what is he trying to communicate he or she is trying to communicate through through making those images why do, why are they gravitated to make these images whether these are images of celebration or mourning whether these are images of pain or ecstasy 
Why do artists want to communicate that? What is it that comes from their personal experiences but translates into a universal significance? What is that universal meaning that they want to leave behind from their own life as they have lived? And of course, if I have to talk about Somnath Hor, one of the most distinguished artists of uh, 20th century in India, I mean, for Somnath Hor, I mean, all artists, in fact, are a product of their own time and their own circumstances. So Somnath was born at a time when he witnessed the Bengal famine in 1943, forced migrations in 1945, riots in 1946, partition, the pain of partition in 1947, and it goes on. And he writes that this pain and grief and separation and human suffering got engraved onto his consciousness very early on in his life, you know. Can you just uh, uh, go back to the first slide, please? So now he spent an entire lifetime trying to articulate the anatomy of pain. What is pain? If somebody asked you as a teacher or as a parent, how do you talk to your child about pain? If I asked you, where does pain reside? Do you know where pain resides? Even if you have a pain in your elbow or your little finger on your toe, it can only become visible through your facial expression, isn't it? Though the pain is somewhere else. Okay, now where does this pain reside? How does it get articulated? How do you process this emotion? And how do you bring it out in art? Has been a preoccupation, not only of Sobhnathor, many of the artists who lived through wars, who saw dead corpses like Somnath witnessed. He saw dead corpses on the street. He saw bleeding bodies, wounded bodies, fragmented bodies, bodies that were waiting for death. You know, and all these got impressed on his mind as a child. And he was constantly through his art because he was a recluse artist. He was a shy child. All the time he was trying to process this through his imagery, through his art, through his formal expression. This is what he was doing. And I'm going to in a very nutshell show you because it's a prolific life of an artist with hundreds and thousands of images. I'm going to show you only six images to let you understand how did he really make pain or the understanding of pain accessible to us through his artistic expression? So when you see his early work, Howrah Station, you are seeing people sitting at the Howrah Station in Calcutta. And look at what he has done to the figures. The figures have become like inanimate objects. They are like pillars or boxes, you know, literally boxed into, you know, their, their natural contours have disappeared. Their bodies have become like boxes and columns. Only their faces carry a human tenderness as if they need some comfort, some rest, some sleep while waiting for their train at the Howrah station. Next, please. He started actually developing an anatomy by pairing all unnecessary elements while he was drawing the body. He was a great artist in terms of having great competent skills of drawing, but he was not drawing to describe a body. He was drawing a body to make it expressive. So first thing he started doing was he started making pairing of all unnecessary elements and simplifying the image. Now, since he had witnessed Bengal famine and a lot of children and mothers dying, you know, people dying, look at it, what he has done to the body. What, does you, what do you see in the drawing? He's constantly trying to understand the anatomy of the body, break it, fragment it, rupture it. And then he comes to an iconic image, which became really his recurrent image throughout his 80, 90 years of life. He made this image which I call is his emblematic image of suffering, suffering and pain. The body has been reduced to a protruding rib cage, an armature, the legs are attenuated, body flesh is disappearing. And what you see of an image is as if it's a hollowed out image, an emptied out image, which can be a, a symbolic of hunger, which can be symbolic of poverty, which can be symbolic of awaiting death. Next, please. 
Next, please. This seed extended also to animals in his world, the surroundings where he had animal friends, dogs, cats, you know, animals also suffer. They are also part of this whole uh, 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 universe in which there are these emotions. So on the one hand, you see a dog and the other a human being and a human being with a dog. And both the human being and a dog become one unit, the right side image, and in between is an empty plate. And since there is an empty plate, there is no food either for the man or for the dog. And if you look at the stomach, the stomach is also like an empty plate, completely hollowed out, you know, evacuated, hollowed out image. Now, this image is not difficult to understand whether you're a grown up, an adult or a child to understand that what, what Somnath is doing is he's trying to make accessible to you suffering through compassion and through empathy for all those suffer, suffering people that he had witnessed. Okay, next please. I find this such a disturbing image. You see a goat which is turning, which is turning into a skeleton and yet she is nurturing her babies without having flesh, without having milk, without having a body. Now, this kind of excruciating analysis and forming of a visual language to convey pain without the use of words. Please understand pain is such a difficult emotion. Grief is such a difficult emotion. It cannot always be accessed through words. You know, it is, it is inaccessible through words. It has to be through some kind of a empathy, empathetic identification to feel the pain of others, to feel the hunger of someone else. And that is what he's trying to do through, the, through this evocative image. Next, please. Oh my God. I mean, what a powerful image of a child wailing and crying with the hands stretched out for help. You know, such expressive gesture with the hands which are crumbling, almost they're disappearing, crumbling, and the mouth is all ruptured because of no because of thirst and hunger and there is this kind of a wailing for help now these kinds of figures or images is what somnath's story was all about he had experienced it firsthand and he wanted to share it with us so that we have this kind of uh, empathy you know what is happening in the world is that we are all living in such a hurried world that we are forgetting that there is a place for feeling emotions. You know, there is a place where we need to cleanse our, our uh, what to say, our uh, feelings of rage, violence, things like that. You know? Next, please. And then he went to an extreme in his career, in his long career. He decided that he completely wanted to eliminate the object. He did not want to show the figure at all and yet speak of a wound or a pain. And so he invented a new technique in a paper pulp print technique in which he just laid poured cement and then he pulled out a pulp print on to it with only some scar, some blister, some wound there. He went to that level of abstraction to talk about the idea of a wound, which does not lie. In his entire life, he was haunted by the idea of a wound. Next, please. And the last slide. But when I'm talking about pain, I'm also wanting you to know that he was constant. When you are in pain, you think of recuperation. It's a natural thing. You want to heal. You want to recuperate. If you're ill, you want to recover. You know, if you are in pain, you want to recuperate. This is a natural process. And so Somnath also made works like this. This is called Birth of a White Rose, wherein amidst all darkness, he actually drew a white rose, which talked about light, talked about light. There is light, there is hope. If humanity survives, there is hope. We need to keep transforming humans to humanize themselves all the time. And this sensitization was the mission of Somnath Hor's life in art. Wow, <laughs> that is absolutely brilliant, Rubina. <laughs> I think for all of us um, to understand Somnath and his art from one of the best 
curators of our country. Thank you so much. So just back to the book. Uh, I'm going to read a little because it is a book launch or a book discussion. So uh, Likla has written a few lines about Shomnath, which I'm going to read. Such was the man who held great compassion. Such was the art that could inspire empathy. This was the legacy that Somnathor left behind. Now, Art First Books has been doing books on children, and this particular book involves a lot of interactive exercises, questioning, as Kripa mentioned, that we had a response from the children. Today, we have the opportunity to have a response from you, the adults. So I'm going to say these questions out to you. And I would like you to internalize it. I will repeat the question so that you can say it in your own mind and find an answer. What is it? The wound that you carry within you. What is it? The wound that you carry within you. What will it take to forgive those who hurt you? What will it take to forgive those who hurt you? How different? How different would the world be without violence? What, what are the colors? What are the colors of sorrow? Time passes, time passes, but what happens to the wounds? These questions are very, very intense, very, very leading. But why are we asking these questions? So Likla, I want to ask you and Kripa and Rubina, what is the relevance of asking these questions today? Why are we asking these questions? Right. So, Rina, when these questions obviously came out of the paintings themselves as a way of looking at the work, um, hoping the children can go a little deeper, think about what they're looking at, maybe forge a personal connection. But having been here the last couple of days, as I'm sure many of you have been as well, we've seen um, you know, the makers of the Crusaders, the leaders of the Crusaders, Viking graves, uh, the occupation of Ukraine, um, poets with heart-wrenching poetry on crimes against minority communities. And I think it's, it's obvious that questions like these are urgent, not only relevant right now. And maybe I'm an idealist that, you know, if you can even start to imagine a world without violence, some form of utopia in your head, there's a hope that you can change reality if you don't think about it. What is going to change in your circumstances? And, you know, where's, where's the empathy? Kripa, would you like to say something? Yeah. yeah, you're right. And often when we are faced with such crises, we don't have, uh, we don't have the luxury of time to assess what we've just been through. And these emotions, these feelings tend to get held up somewhere within us or we tend to tuck them away into some compartment in the brain like a messy miscellaneous drawer and there's no time to clean that drawer. And often it can compound in dangerous ways afterwards. Uh, you know, there's no time for emotions because real life comes rushing back to you. You know, you need to get up in the morning, you need to get to work. So where is the time for emotions? And I think, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why um, such a book also, I, if I were to tell you a little about, I mean, the, the objective of the book yes. uh, is to slow you down, mm -hmm. to allow you to, uh, to reflect upon these questions and, um, and look within. Fantastic. Rubina. I, I, I was so keenly listening to both of you um, <laughs> that I uh, got really uh, carried away in that. Mm. Uh, but uh, yes, so um, I think that 
um, I must just quickly tell you that when I started uh, studying education, I was shown a small, a very little diagram, a simple diagram that said, if you, I don't know anyone from education here, Bloom's taxonomy says that human figure, a human being is made of three important domains, okay? Cognitive, affect, and psychomotor. Cognitive is of the mind, affect is the heart, and psychomotor is your hand and uh, legs, your motor functioning. Now, most times in art, I have seen that if I've been an educator for a very long time, I used to teach in different colleges, art history, uh, that there is such, a, such, a, such an emphasis on scholarship, intellectual scholarship, cognition. You want to tell everything about the artist in terms of uh, cognition, in terms of his scholarship, in terms of intellectualizing him, in terms of theorizing him, or about his skills as to how well he pulled a print, how nicely he sculpted a marble, how well he did what he did in painting, how his strokes worked in impasto or in oil or watercolor. Very little emphasis comes on the domain, which is the most significant domain, the heart, mm. affect. And this affect domain, I think in education is perhaps the most significant domain to work on at the moment. Mm. You know that for years, our education system has been so lopsided with having to in, work on very intelligent subjects or then going to, uh, but considering art, music, these are like secondary or rather the last uh, of the least, last of the lot, okay? Why? Because we think that intellect grows, human being will progress. Okay, psychomotor, he will really conquer the world. Yeah. But what about the heart? If the heart ails, what happens to us? That's true. Rupina. You know, in, the, in these years of pandemic, I lost my mom. I lost many family members. Not just about me. Every second person I spoke with was dealing with personal loss, was dealing with pain because life is so unpredictable. You know, it is something that unexpected, unexpectedly changes. You know, a life changing experience happens and you're left holding on to your, and you don't know how to process those emotions. That's and true. those repressed emotions then create mental health problems. That's true. Where it is so important to think about mental nurturing, caring, caressing, touching, sharing warmth. And that is why I feel these two girls have done a marvelous job and my, for a museum like the Kiran Nada Museum of Art, which is a leading pioneering museum on modern and contemporary art in India. We are working and collaborating and partnering with Art First, with Akar Prakar, because we need such people, such passionate people to really bring together and look at the content of the artist to be able to take it further in terms of participatory exercises for children, for adults, for whoever, in I fact. I and I think that that kind of uh, 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 emphasis I would definitely give on the heart domain, Absolutely. which is a very important thing and which is really missing in our lives. Parents sitting here, please wake up. This is a wake up call. When you see your child alone in a room, don't think that he's a single child and so he loves his solitude. Nobody loves solitude after a point. Yes. Okay. It is something that you are dealing with that is not being able to be processed. And I think for healing, nothing more, nothing better than art. I would really wow. for it. Wow, thank you, Rubina. Just to close, I'd like to say that there's a big show of Shomnathor that Rubina is curating at the Kiranadar Museum of Art, starting from the 28th of April. Oh, or 27th of April. 7th, 28th of April, yes. And uh, there will be the art, uh, the wall of wounds and the wall of healing, which is an interactive session that they are planning with Art First. Do make an effort to go and see the exhibitions. And we will be uh, at the back of the lawns for a book signing with Lika, Likla and Kripa. And Rubina and I are there for questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. On that note, we'd like to thank Likla, Kripa, Rubina Karode, and Rina Lath.
our panelists on stage for first edition presents Healing for a World in Pain, Somnath Hor Wounds. Please note that Likla and Kripa would be available to sign the books for you at the book signing lounge, which is right behind the seating at the front lawns in that cute little yellow tent.